Thanks folks for joining us on the Passive Accredited Investor Show. We are Carolina Capital Management. We are lenders in the Southeast for real estate investors. If you are interested in borrowing money, please go to carolinahardmoney.com and click on the apply now tab. If you're a passive investor looking for passive returns, click on the accredited investor tab. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, hit the bell and sign up please with Wednesdays with Wendy. So Wendy donates 30 minutes of her time per person on Wednesday afternoons to talk about anything in real estate, sign right of your screen or the bottom of your screen, depending on the platform that you're viewing us from. So let's bring on Fernando. So I don't butcher his name anymore. What's his last name? Angelucci. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Fernando. <laughs> anything little, we can do uh, to make you smile. And I'm smiling every time I come on. So here's a little new mnemonic remembering device here. So Angelucci in Italian means angel of light. So Angel Lucci. Nice. Makes it I'll easier. Still, I'll still screw it up, but thanks, yeah. for, <laughs> thanks for sharing. <laughs> so our theme, uh, and again, thank you for coming on. You're always a great, great guest. We get wonderful feedback every time you're on. Uh, we appreciate you coming on. Um, our theme this month is all about the numbers and I, you do such a great job of breaking down what you're looking for when you're looking at self storage value add. I know you um, wholesale a lot of these properties because you're um, you want properties that fit into your particular box. Um, so kind of give us an idea of what you're looking for in that box and how you go about uh, determining those numbers, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So we have three main verticals that we utilize to make money. So the very first is the value add transactions, buying mom and pop facilities, typically in secondary and tertiary markets. What we look for in that vertical is 30,000 plus net rentable square feet with the ability to expand up to 60 to 65,000 square feet. If it's below that or if it's above that, then it's something for our wholesale list. So we'll send it out to our investors. And that works out really well because the primary uh, investors on our list that receive deals from us are either just getting started in self-storage or are on the completely opposite side. And they have, you know, a couple million square feet and they're really looking for large acquisitions at that point. So that's the main vertical. All the way on the other side of the spectrum, we have our ground up developments. So the problem with trying to purchase facilities that are existing that are over 65,000 square feet is that you start competing with the REITs and the hedge funds and the private equity funds. And they have much lower cost of capital than we do. So they can typically drive the cap rate down, compress the cap rate down into the four, four and a half or five percent range. And I'm just not willing to buy properties at that type of unlevered return. For that type of return, I'd rather just put my money in the stock market and not have to do any work. So on the ground up side, what we're typically looking for is if we're going vertical, you know, we're always going to be building class A REIT grade facilities. So if we're going vertical, I'm going to need at least four to five acres. Um, I'm typically going to be buying that acreage anywhere between 50 to $250,000 an acre. And that spread depends on how much work I have to do the land. If the utilities are already there and it's flat and uh, there's already a retention pond in place, I may be paying you know closer to that two hundred and fifty or even three hundred thousand dollars an acre range. But if it's heavily wooded and I have to bring utilities from you know all the way down by the public road uh, and it's not flat, I'm going to have to bring dirt in or I'm going to have to shovel dirt out. Uh, then you start creeping down closer to that fifty dollars or $50,000 an acre. And it roughly translates to, to about one to $5 a foot. If you're more used to um, buying in the per square foot range as opposed to per acre. Now with the pandemic that has hit the country recently, a lot of the supplies that we use and the materials that we use were affected pretty negatively. And that includes steel prices. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so with steel, we've seen a three, four, five hundred percent increase in price depending on what type of steel wow. we're buying. And mm-hmm. because of that, we had to get creative and start pivoting our strategy to build these Class A REIT grade developments. So what we started doing was going after the uh, big box retail space, which has been slowly dying for the last 20 years, but COVID sure. really put kind of the, the, the nail in the coffin there. Mm-hmm. So we were able to start finding these big box retail stores. And by big box retail, what I typically mean is like Sears buildings, Circuit Cities, Kmarts, Walmarts, maybe some grocery stores. Mm-hmm. They're typically on Main and Main. They're surrounded by dense residential. Uh, everyone has uh, some some good disposable income to be to be utilizing. And what I look for in those types of properties is anywhere between 50 to 150,000 square feet. And the reason why I have that large range is on the REIT grade side, our buyers are these large, you know, large publicly traded companies, and they really only want to transact on facilities that are, you know, 80 plus thousand square feet. With that being said, self-storage has an efficiency rate of anywhere between 75 to 85%. So what I mean by that is if I have a 100,000 square foot box, I'm going to lose about 20 to 25% of that square footage to hallways, mechanical closets, offices, bathrooms, things like that. Sure. So that's why we're looking for something that's around the 100,000, 150,000 square foot range. However, if that big box has a clear height or a, a roof height that is high enough, and what clear height means is measured to the bottom of the rafters. So if you're literally clear, there's nothing impeding your impeding your ability to go up. If it has a clear height of 22 feet or better, I can typically mezzanine a level in there. So I can actually put two two levels of storage inside of one building. And that Mm -hmm. allows me to start going after big box stores that are in the 40, 50, 60,000 square foot range, as opposed to reaching for those large facilities. So with that being said, what we've found is after the pandemic, we were able to start picking up these big box stores for pretty cheap, um, anywhere between 10 to $20 a foot. And that allows us to do two things. The first is it allows us to cut our construction time in half. So as opposed to spending 12 months to build a ground up development, uh, we're allowed to compress that down to about six months because we already have the envelope in place. The second piece of that construction timeline is the fact that in some climates, we can't pour concrete because it's too cold, like in the Midwest or in the North. And sometimes we can't pour because it's too hot, like in the South in, in Texas or Florida. Mm -hmm. So that also insulates us or weathers us in from the environment. The second piece is it also drops our total cost of of construction or total project cost by anywhere between a third to a half. So typically I can build a ground up construction for $110 a square foot. When I go to the adaptive reuse or these conversion projects, my total project cost is typically in the 60 to $70 a square foot range, but I can still wow. sell those at the same cap rates that I would those ground up developments. Nice. Wow. So That's pretty solid. because there's already a retail um, facility there and now it's empty, I'm assuming you're not getting a lot of pushback from the municipalities um, putting self storage in place. That's that's correct. So typically what we'll see is the owners of these retail, you know, big box retail stores. First, they try as hard as they can to continue to lease it. They don't even want to sell the asset because they, they're delusional and think another large big box is going to come in at least for 20 years. It's just not going to happen. Then right. once they realize that's not the case and the property's already been sitting vacant for a few years, then they try to sell to another uh, owner that would use the same strategy of trying to get a retail client in there and then that doesn't work for you know two to three years so by this time the property's already been vacant for five six years and when it's not producing cash flow the owners aren't keeping up with the facade keeping up with the you know the pavement repairs on the outside especially in the midwest you know the the frost uh the frost heaving that happens can really destroy that and then it starts to look really blighted uh, on the community. And because it's on a main thoroughfare, you know, you're having tens of thousands of cars pass that 
facility every day and it's looking worse and worse every year. So by the time they're willing to sell, not only to us, but willing to sell to us at the price that we're able to buy at, the municipality is welcoming welcoming us with open arms saying, please do something about this. It looks so terrible. You know, there's typically issues of people breaking in, causing issues yeah. on the inside. So yeah, we we typically get greeted with open arms. The last one that we that we purchased was in Ohio. I actually sent the package to Jonathan. So if you had a chance to look at it, let me know. I did. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So on that <laughs> on that property, uh, the zoning, the rezoning to self storage was probably the the fastest I've ever done. I submitted my business plan. Uh, within a week, they asked me to jump on a Zoom call. I want, I was on the Zoom call for 15 minutes. They asked me three questions, and then they approved my zoning change. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty easy. Yeah. Because yeah. like, so, I, yeah, I noticed easier. I noticed a lot of uh, ground up. They're trying to make it look more like uh, retail on the outside. You know, putting in the fake windows and stuff. And I, I know, I know operators are doing that because the. Uh, demographics of the users are typically um, a higher percentage of women and they like the nicer looking facilities, but at the same time, they're trying to keep the municipalities uh, happy because the, you know, the older self storage kind of looking stuff with the big fence around it and the single garages, uh, you know, I don't want to say they're an eyesore, but they're not as beautiful as you they can't be. You can't build a, you know, <laughs> A fifty thousand square foot brick building and put no windows on it, or even fake ones. Everyone will think it's a strip club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> this windows. And you touched on a pretty important part on you know both sides of the table. So the first side is kind of this NIMBY movement or the not in my backyard movement. Right. So people don't want to see these eyesores, these old school first generation facilities, you know, class C or class D facilities. The second piece is typically the municipalities will have some type of aesthetic guidelines that they would like you to follow to kind of match how the other buildings look in the area. Um, so what we do it is exactly what you described. On these ground-up builds, uh, we typically make them look like Class A office buildings. So you wouldn't really know their storage unless you obviously looked at the windows and see all those fake rolling doors. You know, <laughs> newsflash, those aren't real units. <laughs> Uh, and that helps that helps quite a bit. So not only get it past kind of the initial zoning and, uh, you know, planning committee, but also once you get to the point where you have, you know, open public hearings and the public is allowed to come and voice their concerns. If you show up with these beautiful, you know, what we usually do is come up with these giant three or four foot, you know, printed cardboard displays that show what it would look like you know all the beautiful landscaping and right. sometimes you put like a little public area for people to walk around or sit in then they start to kind of come more over to our side and realize that it's not going to be some gravel facility with you know concrete block walls and barbed wire fencing that's not what we put up yeah. mm -hmm. one of the one of the interesting things that i uh, love about storage like when you take multifamily, you're, when you're trying to identify an area where to lend, you're looking at MSA data, you're looking at, you know, zip code data, all that stuff, um, which is, you know, fairly broad reaching. Mm -hmm. um, when you're looking at storage, like you're not looking, mean, that doesn't mean anything to you, right? You're, you're more granular. So can you, can you kind of talk to people about, about what you're looking at, how you identify a uh, an area that you would want to either build or take a development or, or not development, but a, a rehab on. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you hit the nail on the head there, Jonathan. So self storage is a hyper localized business. And so what I mean by that is the trade areas or the areas that the majority of our customers come from are actually very narrow. And it typically depends on how dense the area is as far as population. So the type, the type of adaptive reuse or the type of, um, value add deals that we like to buy are typically in secondary and tertiary markets, which means that the trade area is anywhere between three to a five mile radius around the facility. And what we found is that 60 to 90% of our customers will come from inside that trade area. And you say, okay, why, why is that? Just kind of think of it logically. I, I'm a mother, 
I have two kids. I got to drop off at school, got to go to work. I see it the same facility on my drive between work and home every day until finally I realize I need storage for some reason. I'm not going to drive 20, 30 minutes in the opposite direction just to go save $5 a month. It's just not worth my time. Sure. So what I'm going to do is I'm typically going to go to the facility that I see on my daily commute or one that is within five to 10 minutes drive time of either my home or my work. Uh, so when you realize that, then all you really have to focus in on is that that hyper localized market. So you can't say things like self storage is saturated in the United States or self storage is saturated in Chicago. All you can say is, well, this three to five mile pocket may be saturated. Let's look five miles away and see if that pocket has a need for storage or is undersupplied. Yeah, I think that's, you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand because I hear that all the time. Oh, storage units, you know, storage facilities are saturated. It's like everyone's doing it. And it's like, yeah, the, 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 a lot of people are doing it. But just for the point that you made, it's you 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 can't say, oh, Charlotte has too many storage units. That, that That's a useless piece of information. What's, you know, what's useful is, well, what pockets are oversaturated and which ones aren't like you just described. So that's yeah, that's a great, great point for people looking for storage units. Yeah, and, and to get granular, I know this is this shows all about the numbers. What we'll measure inside of that trade area are two things, and we'll weight them differently. So the first is called the supply index number. That is the total amount of net rentable square footage offered in that trade area divided by the per capita, or the number of people in that trade area. So typically we want to see somewhere below seven square feet per person in that area. Around seven is where we start to see that the market is somewhat stabilized. Mm -hmm. But there is a, a caveat to that. The second part of this equation is looking at the competitors. If all the competitors are at 90 plus percent occupied, that means that there is a good chance that that market is undersupplied. So you can go into a market that is, say, growing extremely fast and find supply index numbers that are in the 10 or 11 or 12, like you see in Florida. I've been looking at deals down in Florida where the supply index is 18, 19, 20 square feet per person. But that's because the markets are growing so fast that they can't even keep up with the amount of population moving into that market. So what we typically do is we'll give a 30 to 40% weighting on the supply index number. And then we'll give a 60 to 70% rating on the competitor, what rates the competitor are charging, and then what their occupancy is. And if we can come into that market, fill that hole, charge at competitor pricing or just below, then that's going to be a good deal for us. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. And this is anecdotal only. Um, in Inglewood, Florida, uh, there are uh, three storage facilities within a two mile radius of where our place is. And I called one that had been open for just a year and they had a waiting list just to get a unit there. And like I said, there's three within really bicycle distance <laughs> and they're already full. And that's a, that's a really good sign. So when we project our lease up metrics, we're typically looking at about a two and a half to a three and a half percent absorption per month. So if I have a thousand unit facility every month, I'm assuming that two and a half to three, three and a half percent of those units will be leased up, which typically means that for me to get go from zero to 90 percent occupied, it's going to take me 24 to 36 months. So if sure. you go into markets where guys are having wait lists and are completely full within one year, that's a sign to say, hey, I need to go build in this market because there is right. so much pent up demand. Yeah. You know, part of the problem with lots of areas of Florida, particularly along the coast, is that there is not as much buildable land available where the people are. Um, and so that becomes a struggle, uh, being able to find the land at the right price. Well, if you find it, I bet, I bet Fernando would come there and build it. I'm sure. <laughs> so, do you, uh, <laughs> do you utilize the Walmart effect at all? And when you're looking for development, we do, we're actually buying a Walmart right now in Texas, right by South Padre Island. 
Uh, so if if I think I know what you're alluding to, what Walmart likes to do is they will set up a Walmart on in one uh, town, and then they'll set up a second Walmart, maybe a couple towns over. And then what they'll do if they see they have enough demand from both Walmarts is they'll shut both of those down and they'll build a super Walmart in the middle. So what we do is we'll come in and we'll buy those auxiliary Walmart stores and then convert them into self-storage. And the reason we like Walmarts is that they they actually uh, they keep their properties pretty nice. They do a lot of the, the maintenance as it comes available. Uh, same thing with Sears buildings. We found that a lot of the Sears stores, when they were wound down before the company – uh, shuttered that portion of its corporation that they did a lot of preventative maintenance so that they can sell those properties for top dollar. So the roofs are in pretty good condition. The facades are in pretty good condition. The mechanicals, electrical and plumbing are in pretty, pretty con good conditions. One of the stores that we try to avoid at all costs are Kmarts. Yeah. What we found <laughs> is that the Kmarts are typically run to the ground. They don't do a lot of maintenance on those properties while they own them. And then you know, let alone when they're shutting them down, they don't do any right. maintenance. And I think that's just a, a factor of the kind of the financials of that company. Uh, but yeah, we, we love that Walmart effect. I mean, that's if, 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 if a location's good enough for a Walmart, it's good enough for us. Yeah. Cause they, they do serious uh, study uh, when they're deciding whether they're going to put a facility anywhere and they own the properties. They're, they're not, um, just leasing them up. They, they own the stuff. So they, they are wanting their investment uh, to be a good investment over the long period. And you'll see all kinds of other businesses will pop up around a, a mm -hmm. Walmart because they've done all the demographic work for you. Yeah. You, you just locate near them. I, I go up and sell boiled peanuts by the local Walmart. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> So it's it's funny. We have a, a little kind of joke of a saying, but it's it's really not a joke because we use it to fast track some of our deals. If I go to a site visit and I can see a Walmart and smell a McDonald's, it gets jumped to the top of our queue in our underwriting. <laughs> yep. And it sounds like a joke, but think about it. I mean, Walmart yeah. and McDonald's are two of the best companies when it comes to location, 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 right? Sure. Both of those companies are not services businesses or fast food companies. What they really are are real estate companies really? and Absolutely. they have tons of money to do all the demographic studies and find where they want to place their sites. And they're going to put it in a place that gets a lot of traffic because that's the, the, the biggest, well, number one, the McDonald's, you're going to go through the drive through. Um, and then uh, people see the Walmarts all the time and say, Oh, I got to pick up such and such and, and pop in. So they're going to have, they're going to be located on streets that have a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what right. you want in self-storage as well. Cause self-storage is not something that is on somebody's typical mind. Well, it's that branding thing where they. Well, it's they just they like Fernando said yeah, yeah. earlier, where you, you drive by it until you need it. And you're like, Oh yeah, that place. Yeah, that's right. We're always looking for high traffic counts. Uh, one of the things that is important though, is I don't want people out there to think that just because you have a good site that you can neglect everything else. Sure. The fact that you have the brand presence because it's being seen on your daily commute every day is just one part of the equation. After doing a study of our, our 17 facilities over the past three years, what we found is that 60 to 67% of our customers first contacted us by not walking into the store, but seeing our facility and then Googling our facility on a smartphone. So not only do you need a website, but you need a website that is mobile optimized and that Google's suite of companies recognizes as being a trusted website. So we usually like to do the kind of the triumvirate, which is we'll have a uh, we'll claim the Google My Business, which allows us to not only show up on the Google search, but also show up on the um, the Maps. Google Maps locations. Mm -hmm. We'll also create a Facebook account for that business, and then we'll create a Yelp account. And with those three, they kind of create credibility amongst themselves, and it pushes our ranking all the way to the top. Nice. Um, and uh, you're, you also put in automation where you can actually rent the units and do everything else on the website, right? Correct. Yeah. Most of our facilities are automated facilities or they have just a uh, very minimal physical presence. Typically uh, we call them CPOs, uh, chief pretty officers. Their job <laughs> is to go and make sure our, our facilities look pretty. 
Um, so they, they're typically a, a maintenance or janitorial style uh, contractor that we give a base amount to just go check on our facilities one or two hours a week. Um, and that keeps our costs pretty low. It also allows us to uh, make sure we have eyes on the facility because most of the facilities I have purchased are nowhere near me, right? I live in Chicago, Illinois, but I have facilities in nine different states. Mm -hmm. um, and it just doesn't make sense. It's, it wouldn't be a business that I'd want to be a part of if I had to go visit those facilities on sure. a weekly or monthly basis. So yeah, that that's super important. Excellent. Um, Sheree, would you do me a favor and uh, pull up Fernando's uh, website there? Um, you have funds that uh, you raise money for, I'm assuming. That's right. Yeah. And if people want to find out more about uh, passive returns through self storage, and uh, as you know, we're big fans of self storage ourselves. I mean, that's why we make loans on them. We believe in them. They're great business models. Um, and uh, you, you guys uh, uh, contact Fernando through this site. Um, they, they do great business. I know most of the folks he works with, they're uh, awesome operators. And we, anyway. we, we, we believe in them so much. I mean, we do business with Fernando ourselves. Yeah. So like, yeah, we've already uh, closed two deals with uh, Jonathan, Bill and Wendy. We got another two in the pipeline and then a potentially a, a fifth one coming up here pretty soon. So they've been fantastic to work with. They usually close in less than 21 days. It's been fantastic, especially when, we're trying to get deals at significantly discounted prices. Um, across our entire portfolio, we have an average discount to market of about 28%. And the only way that we're able to do that is by offering quick close mm -hmm. with a uh, minimal dock. Um, typically when you go to try to get a traditional loan on a self storage facility, the bank that you're working with is gonna require the seller to put up three years of their, of their tax returns. And what I found is that uh, a lot of sellers uh, cook their books a little bit. So they, they, they pocket a lot of cash and then they report maybe a third to a half of what they're actually bringing in on their tax returns. So they don't like to do that. Yep. So that puts us at a at a an advantage uh, of all the competitors when we come in and we make offers. Even if those offers, I can't tell you how many times we've had our offer accepted at a lower price than a competitor just because we were able to close fast and it wasn't a hassle to close with us. Yep. So yeah, I was just gonna say the advantage of this self storage business itself is that it is a business before it's real estate. We all do it because it's real estate, but uh, SBA financing at very high loan to values is available and uh, they can easily, once they get them stabilized, they can get them refinanced fairly quickly with uh, pretty high loan to values, even uh, they allowing go to for operating. Do they go up uh, to 90 cash too, right? Where, where do they go up to? Is it 90 for Yeah. Them so they'll go up to 90% loan to cost. And then they'll in also include working capital in addition yeah. to that, to the loan amount. So they'll give you some cash to operate right out of the gate. So yeah, SP is a good option if you have time and you have sellers right. that have, that you have, uh, have been forthright on their tax returns. If you don't have time or you don't have sellers that, have uh, factual books, SBA is going to be a nightmare and it's not going to work out. Well, well I was going to say you, you get the short term acquisition loan, you get it stabilized and then you go to SBA because you're going to have, a, they're not going to ask for the seller's tax returns because you're not selling it. You already own it. You're just trying to refinance it. And, and they'll, take, right. they'll take your books. And even if it takes you uh, a, a full tax return season uh, to get it, um, you, you get great financing, refinance, cash out, uh, operating expenses, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, a, it's just a great, great model. And the interesting part about mm -hmm. SBA financing is that they have fully amortized loans. So you can get a 25 year fully amortized loan through the SBA, which is almost unheard of for commercial right. investment property, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Because you know what's going to happen if there's a balloon, which there always is on a commercial loan, is that the year you have to refinance is when the economy is going to be down and you that's right <laughs> for as much money as you need. <laughs> it's just Murphy's right. law. <laughs> um, Fernando, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, like I said, we always get great feedback when you're on. Uh, you give people some uh, really good content and people get excited about uh, self-storage when, when you're on. So yep. th thank you for 
uh, being on the show. Thanks, guys. And if you wouldn't mind, so what I've been finding out recently, I've been doing a little testing, a little little test pilot here. I find that somebody going to a website, then clicking a link to schedule, and then eventually actually talking to me is, is seems to be a lot of work for a lot of people. So what I'll sure. do is I'll give you guys my cell phone number, and hopefully that will spur people into action to reach yeah. out and actually you know try to do some deals or learn about storage. So my cell phone Absolutely. number is... Go ahead. Area area code 630-408-8090. That's 630-408-8090. That's the real one. That's, that's that the is, real one. <laughs> that's my real cell phone number. You can call or text me. I'll answer it, I promise. And it's funny. I, I put this out there on, you know, your guys' show and other shows that I've been on where, you know, they have a ton of listeners, thousands and thousands of listeners, and still I'd say less than 1% of the people actually take me up on it. It's well, crazy. There, there's a number on the screen, and uh, Shrub is probably going to stick it in the comment section as well. So it'll be there permanently forever on the YouTube channel. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Th thanks again, Fernando. Uh, have a wonderful day. Uh, probably see you in uh, December if we don't uh, talk before then. Yes, sir. I'll see you there. All right. Uh, folks, thank you once again for joining us on the Passive Accredited Investor Show. We are Carolina Capital Management. We are lenders in the Southeast for real estate investors. If you're interested in borrowing money, go to carolinahardmoney.com and click on the Apply Now tab. If you're a passive investor looking for passive returns, click on the Accredited Investor tab or go to Fernando's website. Don't forget to <laughs> like, share, subscribe, hit the bell, sign up for Wednesday with Wendy. And you guys have a great week. We'll job, see you Bill. next time.